Hey, good morning, Lighthouse Church. This is Brett Hollis. I was supposed to be there with you this morning, and because of the coronavirus, I was unable to do that. So you know what? We're just going to praise the Lord anyways and just, oh, well, you'll have to excuse me. I, in today's day and age, I want to make sure that my most precious belongings are uh, secure. No one can get them. So I like to carry around a roll of toilet paper in my secure bag with me. It's crazy how uh, things have been happening here around uh, Washington, well, really all over the world lately. I've noticed they were talking about different ways of testing people for the coronavirus. I see them pull up uh, in a car. They've got these drive-through uh, deals. You can pull up in a car. They take this stick that's like the size of a, of a chopstick, shove it up your nose. So far, I'm sure it's touching uh, brain material. And yet we're supposed to stand six feet away from each other because we might get it. Can we not just spit in a bucket as we drive by or something and, and make things easier than, uh, than they really are? I don't know. It's a confusing time. It's a crazy time in our world. But let me just tell you why I have this roll of toilet paper up here. It's not just because I want to make sure it's always in my possession, but it's because it reminds me of something. You know, people get desperate. They do desperate things at desperate times. And it's funny how two weeks ago, people began to seek toilet paper out like it was some precious item. And now you go and you can't find toilet paper anywhere. People are seeking so many different things that they normally wouldn't do. And the Bible says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. And here's what I want to say. When we seek the Lord, all these other things will be added unto us. So let's not be fools that are running out and grabbing at the wrong things and doing this and putting our focus on all of our worries and all that. Listen, we're in a season as a church where we have opportunity. This is opportunity, okay? I realize that we're supposed to be homebound and all these different things, but we have an opportunity to do things that we normally say we don't have time to do. So many times we say, oh, I'd love to read the Bible. I just don't have time. I'm so busy with her. Or I'd love to pray, but I don't have the time to pray because I'm so busy doing these other things. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. You're basically imprisoned in your home. Let's spend the time, instead of just binge-watching Netflix for hours, why don't you spend the time really seeking God and seeking him while he may be found. This is an opportunity for the church. This is the time that we're without excuse. Let's do the things that we know we need to do and uh, make it the highest priority. So I am going to say a prayer, and we're going to launch into a message that I believe will be encouraging for you, and, uh, and we'll start with that. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for Lighthouse Church, Lord, and just their friendship and and uh, the things that you're doing in that place god i pray that you would bless fond du lac through them i pray lord that you would do some amazing things today through this time and lord in the days to come the weeks to come i pray that the church would spend time seeking you praying calling on you and that lord that we would see you do amazing things in these days to come so, Father, we just ask your blessing on our time together here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I guess I'll remove this. It might be a little, <clears throat> a little bit of a distraction. Hey, I want to tell you where I'm at right now. I am in Seattle, Washington. I am standing on the platform of Philadelphia Church that has been in our fellowship, the Fellowship of Christian Assemblies, for many, many, many years. And they have blessed me with the opportunity to just come and borrow their platform, their pulpit, their cameras, so that I can give you a message this morning. Uh, keep Philadelphia Church in prayer. I'm going to tell you a little bit more why here in a moment. But let me just say this. If it wasn't for the Fellowship of Christian Assemblies, I would not know your Pastor Tim. I wouldn't know any of you because Pastor Tim and I met years ago uh, through a convention and different connections that we had together and out of that has blossomed a great friendship not only with him but with the staff there and with all of you and so fellowship of christian assemblies has been uh, around for many many years and god has blessed it we're excited to join efforts with you guys and help spread the gospel 
Let me tell you why I would like you to pray for Philadelphia Church. Philadelphia Church has gone through an interesting time since Christmas. You see, Pastor Derek Forseth, who's the pastor here, he went in on Christmas morning um, to the hospital. And to make a very long story short, and I mean like a three and a half month long story short, he has had well over 20 or about 20 procedures uh, and surgeries. He's had uh, so many things. He's, he really was facing death many, many times over. And it's just been a crazy time. So he actually has not been here in the pulpit since Christmas, um, spending most of his time in ICU. And uh, I've been able to have the honor of coming up and, and speaking on his behalf uh, while he's gone much of the time. But with all of that said, I want to encourage you today because what the church needs more than anything, I think, these days is encouragement. And if you'd like to take your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, I'd like to just start this message off with some encouragement. Hebrews 10, 19 says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Now I'm going to pause there for a second. I think this starts off in a really nice way because we have basically been told we can't leave our house or go anywhere. And here scripture is telling us, well, you can enter one place. You may not be able to enter your favorite restaurant anymore. You may not be able to go to all the places you used to go or want to go. But here's what scripture is telling us. You can go and you are invited to go into God's very presence it says have confidence entering the most holy place by the blood of jesus so as we go through these difficult times as a nation and as a world let's first remember that although we're being banned from entering a lot of other places in public we are invited into the presence of god and we're invited into the presence by the blood of jesus christ so then he goes on to share with us in verse 20 that that way was opened for us through the curtain, that is, the body of Jesus. Now, jumping down to verse 22, it says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Then he gives us four more let us. Okay, I say it because all of these phrases start with let us. That one was let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. Here's the next let us. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. This is what we need to do in this day and time. When we are stuck at home and we're wondering how are we going to pay our bills and what's going to happen and what are we going to do next, this is, this is your responsibility. Your responsibility is just trust God. God knew all this was going to happen long before any of us did. And God is faithful. I'll, I'll tell you, almost every single morning since all of this has started, I pull out a, an old hymn book in my office at home, and I sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, because it's a reminder to me of how great His faithfulness is. And I love to declare to Him how great his faithfulness is, and he is. And so what we need to do is we need to unswervingly uh, hold to that hope that we profess. And it's times like this that hope and faith are going to be trusted, or uh, tested, I'm sorry, tested more than any other time. In fact, the question is, is what is faith if it's not tested? What is hope if it's not tested? These things need to be tested so that we're sure that we have them. And what better way to test them than the coronavirus? But God is faithful. And in verse 24, he goes on to the next, let us. He says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Okay, it should be our goal, no matter whether we're able to be with people or we're stuck at home alone, it should be our goal. How can I encourage other people believers onto good deeds and how to persevere 
And so with today's technology, listen, you've got, well, you've got the old-fashioned phone. You can still call one another. You can text one another. You could send letters in the mail. There's different ways. You can FaceTime one another. There are different ways that you can still encourage. And here's the thing is we all need encouragement. Encouragement is the one thing that really gets us moving and gets us on to the next step. And there are things in your life right now that you could use encouragement for. So why don't you take the time to reach out and encourage somebody else in something and trust that God will bring you the encouragement back to you. Now, he says, let's encourage uh, how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now, here's the fifth let us. The fifth let us is verse 25. It says, let us not give up meeting together. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying that as a joke. I mean, obviously, we can't do that. He's saying, let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, obviously, we're not supposed to get together and encourage, at least in, in larger groups. I don't know what it is in Wisconsin. Here, they're saying 10 or less people. I think they're even trying to bring that down to two people I, I i don't know what all they're just trying to make it safe for everybody safe distancing six feet these different things but even though you cannot be together maybe in person maybe you can reach out in some other way to encourage and one of the things that i want to do to encourage you today is i want to encourage you to know this you may not think you can get through this and this meaning these circumstances, this day and age, this time, this coronavirus. But I'm here to tell you, you can and you will. And we need to change our language from I can't to I can. I mean, how many times in your life did you get through something that if someone were to tell you ahead of time that this is what you're going to go through, your response would have been, I can't. There's no way I can do that. Someone, someone says to you, well, you're going to lose a child or you're going to lose your job or your house is going to burn down or you're going to lose your job or you're going to go through a, a, an illness and or or uh, whatever the case may be you might look at that from the get-go and say i can't do that i can't do that and then all of a sudden somehow some way you get on the other side of it and you realize not only can i i did i got through that there's so many examples in history. There's examples in the Bible. We see maybe a Joseph. If, if uh, Joseph was told, listen, you're going to be thrown into a big pit. Your brothers are going to sell you. You're going to end up being falsely accused. You're going to be thrown in jail. You're gonna do he may have said, I can't, but he did. He made it through it. I'm standing here at Philadelphia Church where Pastor Derek uh, Forseth pastors, and as I said, he's gone through this huge change in life where the doctors, he was close to death so many times, and he's gone through, he's going through recovery right now. He just got out of ICU. He's been in ICU for a long, long time. And uh, his wife, Krista, instantly became like a single mom overnight, had to take care of all of the details of the house, had to take care of, uh, you know, dealing with her job, dealing with uh, uh, the bills, dealing with all these other things, and going down and visiting her husband every night and, and sitting in waiting rooms for hours and hearing bad news and then good news and then bad news and trying to process all of these different things, um, sleepless nights of going through all of this kind of stuff. And I think if you would have told her on Christmas Eve, the night before this all happened, that she was going to go through this, perhaps, perhaps, I'm not trying to put words in her mouth, but perhaps she would say, no way, I can't do that. And there are things that she has faced that I don't think she ever dreamed she would face. And now, three and a half months later, she's looking back and she's not only saying, I can, but I did and I am doing that. And I know that there might be things in your own life where you feel like you just can't do this. Maybe this coronavirus thing has really gotten to you and you're feeling like, I just can't do this anymore. Yes, you can. You see, 
I want to read with you a scripture that I hope is encouraging to you. This is in Philippians chapter 4. It's verse 11. We're going to read verse 11 through 13. And it says this. It says, Paul says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Now I want to pause there and just say this. This letter the, to the Philippians that Paul wrote, he's writing this while he's in prison. He has been falsely accused of different things. He's been shipwrecked. He's gone through all kinds of craziness in his life. And he might have, he might have even said at the beginning when, when, in fact, Jesus did tell him at the beginning, or he said, he said um, to, uh, oh man, who was I, the, the Annas, the one that, the one that came and prayed over him and gave him his sight back after he was uh, blinded, God told him, he said, listen, Paul is my instrument. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. But if Paul would have known all the different ways that he was going to suffer for God's name, he might, he might have said, I can't do that. But now he's in prison experiencing it, and this is what he writes. He says, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, he says, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Now, Paul learned these different things. How do we learn things? Well, someone might teach us, we might read it. Nowadays, we might watch something on YouTube and we learn how to do something. But the best teacher is experience. When we experience something, we learn something to a greater degree. And what Paul is showing us here is he learned something. He learned how to be content in any and every circumstance. And he learned this because he experienced it. He says, I know what it is to be in need. There were times that he had a lot of need. And he could say, he could stand there and he says, I know what it is to have need. And I know a lot of times uh, when we hear someone that can relate to us, you know, someone, you know, we might go through a situation and someone might say, you know, I had the same exact thing happen to me. Sometimes that alone is really encouraging because, one, it makes us realize, well, we're not the only ones that have gone through this. And two, if they can get through it, perhaps I can get through it. And here Paul is saying, listen, I know what it's like to have need. Some of you are experiencing need at different levels than you've ever had before. Paul says, I know what it is to have plenty. Maybe, remember those days? Remember the days when you walked into Walmart and there was all the toilet paper you needed and there was all the hand sanitizer that you needed? We, had, you know, we didn't even know we were going to be in desperate need. All of a sudden now, oh man, you got as much Easter candy as you'll ever need, but the toilet paper's gone, the hand sanitizer's gone, all the cleaning products are gone, and we're putting ourselves in this new scenario now where we're realizing you know, I, I remember when I had plenty, and now I'm really re- realizing what it's like to be in need. And now, maybe it's not some little example like that, but maybe with this whole coronavirus thing, you have realized, man, when I had plenty, it was different than it feels like now that I have need. And I want to just say that God allows you to have plenty because he wants to teach you something about having plenty. And he also allows you to have times of need because he wants to teach you in those times of need. And the, the, the thing that we need to do is we need to ask God in every situation, in every circumstance, uh, what do you want me to learn from this? What do you want me to take away from this? Here's what Paul learned. He says, I have learned through those experiences, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And here's the key, he says, verse 13. Here is the secret. The secret is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's it. That's the key. That's the secret. That's his point. He's like, listen, all of these different things I went through, I learned. I learned from experience, I learned from experience that I can do it. I can make it by having plenty and and use my plenty wisely and use it to honor God and to glorify God. I've also learned when I am in need and I have want, I can do it. I can make it 
But he throws in that other scenario. He says, he says in every circumstance, every, any and every situation. And so here I want to tell you this. You can do this. Maybe you got up this morning and you're like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this. Well, I'm here to tell you on behalf of God, we just talked this morning, on behalf of God, you can do this. Change your language. Change your language from the I can't to I can. We need to learn how to say I can instead of I can't. I can't is so negative. I can't is so limiting. I can is so freeing. I can is so powerful. And I can is the truth. You see, he says, I can do all things. I can do anything. I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. And that's the point. The point is not your ability. The point is Christ's strength within you. Now, a lot of people like to say, when someone else is going through a difficult time, they like to say, hey, God will never give you more than you can handle. And when someone says that to you, oftentimes you want to just punch them in the throat. But you're sitting there because you're the one going through it, and you know, you feel like, I can't do this. I can't. And God will never give you more than you can handle. Now, there is truth to that. And the, the idea is taken from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation or trial, it's the same word used there, no temptation or trial has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But he will always provide a way out for you so you can stand up under it. Now, he will never let you be tempted or go through trials beyond what you can bear. Well, here's what I think with this. I believe God does let us face things that we cannot handle or bear on our own. I think God allows us to be faced with things at times that we go, I, I am too weak to handle this. I cannot do this. But in Christ, you can do all things. So it's not a trick. It's not a play in words. It's that sometimes God will allow you to see your limits and allow you to see your weaknesses so you realize how dependent on God you need to be and that you really are. So when I'm facing those giants, I can say, on my own, I can't do this. On my own, I'm not strong enough. On my own, I can't handle this. But in Christ, in Christ, all things are possible. In Christ, all things are possible for those who believe. Nothing is impossible for those who are in Christ. Paul says in Ephesians 6, when he's talking about the armor of God and putting on the armor of God, he, he starts by saying, stand in the strength in God's strength. Don't stand in your own. It's not about your own strength. It's about being in his strength. So when Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, he's not talking about you doing it on your own. He's talking about having Christ do it in you and through you. We don't know what we can do until we do it. We So often we will hear someone else's story and we say, I could never do that. I could never do that. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in a similar situation and you realize, hey, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that lives in me. If God will help that person get through it, God will help me get through it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now here's the thing about that strength. I want us to look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we will be in verse 7. Paul had been talking here about some revelations, pretty amazing revelations that he had had. And he says in verse 7, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. How many times have you been in some circumstances you didn't like and you, you prayed and you pleaded with God to take away the circumstances or change the circumstances and he doesn't. Instead, he does something different. 
And how frustrating sometimes that can be for us. Well, here's the Apostle Paul, who, by the way, shows that even Paul did not get every one of his prayers answered. But he cried out, saying, God, I want you to remove this. And instead of God saying, okay, yeah, because Paul, I really like you or whatever, here's what he does. He says, no, Paul, I'm not going to remove these, but I'm going to tell you something. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I think in Christian circles, sometimes we throw around grace so lightly that we forget the power of grace. Paul says in Romans, we stand in grace. That's where we stand. That's how we stand firm. And it is by grace you've been saved. And God is saying here to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Here's the thing. We can sit there and we can go, oh God, I hate these circumstances. I can't do this anymore. And God is saying, listen, I want you to hear something very clearly today. My grace is sufficient for you. (laughs) You might say, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted my circumstances to be changed. But if you realize the revelation of how powerful God's grace is, you'll get through any circumstance that you're faced with. So when he realizes this, this now leads the rest of Paul's life. He understands because God said, my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul goes on to say, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, I don't know how many of us can say, Ooh, man, I delight in weaknesses. I can't wait for the next really big insult in my life. Oh, hardships, they're some of my favorites. Persecutions, yeah, those are great. And I delight in difficulty. I can't wait for the next difficulty. But what Paul was saying here is the reason he delights in these things is because it's a realization to him and the people around him that when he is weak, he is really strong because Christ lives in him. So let us look at our difficult situations and our circumstances and let's stop saying, I can't do this. You can You can do this in Christ. If Christ is in you, you can do it. I remember when my son was between the age of 10 and 12, I I asked him to mow the lawn, and he argued and complained and said, I can't do it, and he got the lawnmower out, and he says, I can't start it, and he didn't even try, and I knew he could do it, he didn't try, and I said, well, I said, you know what, you're not going to do anything else until you get that mower started. Oh, he complained, and I sat there, and I said to him, you know what? There are 10-year-old boys running entire farms in Wisconsin. I may not have said Wisconsin. I might have said North Dakota. But anyhow, there are boys running huge farms in Wisconsin, and I'm asking you to mow a little tiny patch of grass. Our grass is like a, a, a large chia pet. It's just this little area of lawn that grows real quick. And Anyhow, I sat there and I said, you're not doing anything until you mow that lawn. Well, wouldn't you know it? He got the lawnmower started. He figured it out. And see, a lot of times in our life, we complain and we whine and we say, I can't do it, I can't do it, until we're pushing the corner. And then we realize, I can do it in Christ. In fact, I can do all things in Christ. In fact, there's nothing I can't do if I'm in Christ. So let's change the language from I can't to I can. You see, I can because I am a child of God. I can because greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. I can because I am more than a conqueror in Christ. I can because neither life nor death, present nor future, angels nor demons, trials, afflictions, nothing separates me from the love of God. I can because he has redeemed me. I can because I'm his beloved. I can because I have a call in my life. I can because he says I can. I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I must get in Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ personally this morning, I'm begging you, call on him while he can still be found. Seek him. And you will find him. And you will find that when you call on Jesus Christ and you 
accept him as your Lord and Savior, his life and his power will come in you and you'll be able to do all things. You'll be every circumstance you're faced with that you think I can't do, you can do in him. And Christian, let me, in, let me remind you, church, you can do this. You can get through this time. Let's change the language from I can't to I can because when you are weak, then you are strong. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for all those in the Fond du Lac community and those that are hearing this message today. God, would it be encouraging to each one to really look at every circumstance, every giant, every mountain in their life through eyes of faith and to stop saying, I can't, and start saying, I can, I can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So Lord, fill us with your spirit, empower us today, help us to walk in that power and to walk in that faith. And Lord, I pray your special blessings, uh, Father, on Lighthouse Church, and I just ask God that as they encourage one another, that uh, they would be built up and made strong. And when the day comes, when they can all gather back together again, that, Lord, it would be a time of celebration. And so, Father, I just commit them to you and your blessings on them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and God bless.